they're seen as the muscle of the Russian military, feared for their brutality on the battlefield. Soldiers from Chechnya fighting for President Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. The Chechens are believed to be in the thick of a fighting here, in what's left of Mariupol. They've released this footage, they say is from inside the city. It shows them going house to house and firing on residential buildings. They're loyal to this man, Ramzan Kadyrov, the pro-Kremlin president of the Chechen Republic, who calls himself Putin's foot soldier. I'd like to give some advice to the current president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, before he becomes the former president of Ukraine. You should hurry up and call our president, the commander-in-chief, Vladimir Putin, and ask for his forgiveness. During the Second Chechen War, Kadyrov and his militia helped Moscow defeat separatist rebels and bring Chechnya back under Russian control. It was a brutal war that left the capital Grozny in ruins, scenes similar to the destruction seen today in Ukraine. Kadyrov claims tens of thousands of his men are fighting in Ukraine. Whatever their true number, they're seen as a potent psychological weapon for Vladimir Putin. But analysts suggest they might actually be more hype than help. This footage, filmed by the Ukrainian military on the outskirts of Kyiv, claims to show what's left of a Chechen column after an ambush. Burnt-out armour litters the road. But Kadyrov denies his forces suffered any setback. Some say that many of our fighters were killed. We have not sustained a single loss. Not a single soldier has been wounded. Not a single soldier scratched. Not a single person has even caught a cold. A fierce firefight in a village northeast of Kyiv. This video was posted on social media by a Ukrainian volunteer unit. It's believed fighters from Chechnya are in its ranks, fighting for the government in Kyiv and against Ramzan Kadyrov. Chechens on both sides of a front line, in a war within a war. Well, for more on this aspect, I'm now joined by Miriam Hess. She's a research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations, who's written extensively on Chechnya and its militias. Now, Ramzan Kadyrov calling for the storming of Kyiv, just as Russia announces uh, it is scaling back its forces in that area. Is he acting outside of the Kremlin's authority? Well, first of all, I think we have to understand uh, Kadyrov's role really in the Putin's uh, power structure. And this is more um, that Kadyrov is really the only person or one of the persons that is only loyal to Putin himself, right? So I think this narrative of him acting outside of Putin's command is something I'm highly skeptical about. I think um, this maneuver of him really like trying to emphasize this war narrative of being ready to storm and um, like to fight Kiev is something which is just like playing into the narrative of him um, trying to in instrumentalize um, the stereotype of the Chechen war proven combat experience fighter again. So I'm highly skeptical about him really acting outside of Putin's command. Um, I rather think that he's um, trying to add some fight experienced um, narrative again to the conflict as Russia is now like allegedly retrieving its troops from mm. um, Kiev. Now, in our report, uh, we mentioned the, a war within a war. Tell us more about this very complex role that Chechens and Chechen fighters are playing in Ukraine. Yes, um, I think um, Chechens um, living in exile, for example, in Europe, um, then trying to fight um, Russia and some kind of international battlefields is something that is not new. It is not new now. Um, we also witnessed that not, not like recently in Syria. So it is really Chechens now fighting on the Ukrainian side is a phenomenon that is really corresponding to um, the Chechen history of like experiencing two, of having experienced two wars and the, they're now trying to um, 
like really extend and continue their fight against the Russian um, system and, or a Russian regime. Because now the fight, uh, the second Chechen war, for example, was initiated by Putin and he is still, of course, the leader. And what makes the Chechen narrative on the Ukrainian side now so so more like conscious or aware for us is uh, or prominent for us is that um, the war now is a war between um, Ukraine and Russia. And in Syria, for example, the Chechens were also very prominent um, and very present. But mm. because this war was like more under the narrative of some kind of like jihad, um, we really not like took it as it was, um, meaning that uh, the Chechens fighting on the Ukrainian side are really trying to continue the battle against um, Russia. On mm. the um, Russian side, as you said uh, already, there are the Kadyrovtsi, meaning this private uh, military militia um, from Kadyrov, fighting on the um, Russian side and really trying to like be part of some kind of psychological warfare and to frighten Ukrainians into like really surrendering. It's interesting that you mentioned that it is frightening uh, the Ukrainians. Kadyrov's uh, Chechen fighters have a fearsome reputation. Um, is it justified? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it is hard to say that it's justified because if we think about um, the, the history of Chechnya, there's not really like a situation in which the Chechens on Russian side could have proven themselves to be that combat experienced, right? Because the Chechens that are fighting now on the pro-Russian side are rather young and the war is over not only for two years, but a little longer. So there is not really like, there is no proof that they are really that mm. fight and combat experienced. It is rather, um, yeah, they're rather like really trained to secure protest and to like really secure any kind of political opposition, opposition within Chechnya, but it is really hard to like say, okay, so this, those are the guys within Ukraine we should really be afraid of because there's no like, no recent uh, example where we could have be really like, yeah, seen their combat experience. Miriam Hess then, with the German Council on Foreign Relations, thank you very much for joining us. Russia's pledge to reduce military operations around the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, has been met with skepticism by the United States and Ukraine. They say Moscow is just repositioning troops and not withdrawing. Over in Ukraine's eastern region of Donetsk, held by Moscow-backed rebels, heavy shelling damaged apartments. And in Irpin, as a suburb of Kyiv, Russian forces have been pushed back, leaving ruins behind. Well, Russia's pledge to reduce its operations around two Ukrainian cities came after peace talks between Russian and Ukrainian delegations in Istanbul. Ukraine has proposed that it is willing to become permanently neutral, but says it requires security guarantees from a group of nations. Another round of peace talks, but this time with first signs of progress. As Ukraine opens up to discuss adopting a neutral status, Russia promised to scale down operations. The Russian Defense Ministry has made the important decision to decrease military activity several fold in the direction of Kyiv and Chernihiv, to increase mutual trust and create the necessary conditions for further negotiations. Negotiations that will be needed to increase trust, but in action and not in words, Ukraine's president stressed. Yes, we can say that the signals we hear from the talks are positive. But these signals can't silence the explosions of Russian shells. Of course, we see all of the risks. And of course, we don't see grounds to trust the words coming from representatives of the country that continues trying to destroy us. Russia's announcement was also met with skepticism in Washington. But I think we should be clear-eyed about the reality of what's happening on the ground, and no one should be fooled by Russia's announcements. We believe any movement of forces from around Kyiv is a redeployment and not a withdrawal, uh, and the world should be prepared for a major offensive against other areas of Ukraine. Offensives that, in the future, should be stopped by other countries acting as security guarantors. An idea that Kyiv proposed in exchange for neutrality and in place of NATO membership. As peace talks gain momentum, there is now also another possibility on the horizon, a high-level meeting between both presidents. 
Now let's bring in DW correspondent Matthias Berlinger. He is in Kyiv. Uh, Matthias, Russia says it will drastically reduce its military activity near Chernihiv in the north and the capital Kyiv. What is your assessment from the situation on the ground there? Well, from what we're hearing, and I mean what we're hearing, uh, the thunder we're hearing in the air, the shelling that we can hear, even here from the city center of Kiev, uh, fighting has not uh, relented. It has, if anything, intensified. Of course, we cannot uh, hear who has fired which rounds, and uh, we also know that there has been offens an offensive by the Ukrainian army. But the fighting is, at this moment, going on and uh, what we have been hearing from uh, officials in this um, suburb of Kiev Irpin that the Ukrainian army claims to have reconquered is that the place is still regularly shelled by the Russian army on the other hand it's also not clear what mean what it means to reduce fighting it uh, we know what it means to uh, halt fighting, but what? How, how do we measure a reduction in fighting? Um, it's it's never at the same intensity level anyway. So um, there are many questions about that, and there is also deep distrust here, not only from officials but also in the population. Um, what, in, as far as this announcement is concerned, Russia has previously. Uh, uh, withdrawn or, or, or said it would withdraw, uh, withdraw its troops and then attacked afterwards. So uh, we have to see what happens on the ground until we can make an assessment of that. Mm. Matthias, there, there have also been reports about intensified shelling in eastern Ukraine. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, we've heard these reports and they're in line with what Russia has said. Russia has said at the same time it would... Um, uh, ease uh, its attack here on the capital of Kiev uh, and concentrate on what they call the liberation of Donbass, which uh, means that uh, they would uh, most probably try to conquer as much territory as possible of these two districts, Luhansk and Donetsk, part of which uh, was controlled by the self-proclaimed re republics that Russia has recognized in the run-up to this war. So um, an intense, uh, intensified fighting in that region would be totally in line with what Russia has said. DW correspondent Matthias Böllinger there talking to us from Kiev. Thank you, Matthias. And our next guest is Aglaya Snetkov. She's a writer and the author of Russia's security policy under Putin. Uh, Aglaya, Russia claims it will reduce its military activity. Western governments say they have to see it to believe it. Are you seeing it and are you believing it? So I think following the announcements um, that the Russians would cut down on the shelling of Kiev and Chernyov. At the moment, we're not seeing that. As your correspondent suggested, there has been intensified shelling of both cities overnight. Um, if we're looking at what's happening on the ground, there has been some withdrawal of Russian troops from outside Kiev, but there hasn't been major movements of troops. Mm. So, so do you think it's rather, a way, it's, a with, it's rather a regrouping uh, uh, than, than a, a, a withdrawal? So I think the Russians will move towards fighting sort of a war and attrition probably closer to Donbass. And they're still hoping, once they have captured Mariupol, to create a land corridor from Crimea going all the way to Donbass. That will be the focus from now on, I would mm. suggest. Now, this is one of the largest armies in the world, the Russian, the Russian army. Why have they been unable to meet their military objectives so far? So in some ways, we actually have been all very confused about what the military objectives were. So it is the largest army. They have, in theory, reformed the army after the failure of the Georgia 2008 war. But it seems that the initial assumptions of a quick operation in Ukraine has failed. They were overstretched. They tried to do it from three fronts. The logistics have been fairly poor. There is a strong lack of coordination. We still have no idea who's actually directing the military operation. And, you know, there's poor morale on the ground. Effectively, they have also come up against very great um, Ukrainian resistance. 
So we mustn't underestimate sort of the Ukrainian mm. resistance, but also sort of the political failures of choosing this campaign. Now, the hope of a quick victory has long been dashed. What other options might Putin be considering right now? I think at this point, they will be focusing on Donbass. I think the war of attrition, trying to grind the Ukrainian forces down in the east, Mariupol continues to be the focus. And as I said, the creation of sort of that land corridor, we will continue seeing um, shelling of other areas in Ukraine. But I would assume, at least for now, the focus on is on eastern Ukraine. However, that does not mean that the Russian operations won't shift in the future. Aglaya Snetkov, they're an expert on Russian foreign and security policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Germany's government is activating an early warning plan to prepare for possible shortages of gas deliveries from Russia. Economy Minister Robert Habeck says a crisis team is being established to monitor gas supplies. This follows Moscow's demand for payment in rubles, which Germany and many other importers have rejected. Habeck, who is with the environmentalist Green Party in Germany's government, also urged industry and households to conserve energy. We are we are in a situation where I have to say clearly that every kilowatt hour of energy saved helps. And that is why I would like to combine the triggering of the early warning level for gas supplies with the appeal for help to companies and private consumers. You are helping Germany, you are helping Ukraine when you reduce your use of gas or energy in general. Now, our political correspondent uh, Jared Reed is following this story and joins us now. Jared, what is this early warning plan and what does it mean that, it, that they've activated it? Right, so Gerhard, this is a level one of a three-level response. Uh, and basically what this early warning level means is that a crisis team is going to be meeting every day. Uh, they will be made up of representatives from Robert Habeck's industry, who we just uh, heard from in that soundbite, but also service providers of energy, representatives of the regions in Germany. They're going to be meeting every day and monitoring the situation closely and, I guess, working out uh, their responses to the next next two levels, uh, which are the alarm level and then eventually level three, uh, the uh, emergency level. And as you mentioned, this is in response, I guess, to a demand from Vladimir Putin that gas be paid for uh, going forward in rubles. This is something that the G7 group of nations, which is led by Germany at the moment, has rejected. And in response, the Kremlin is due to announce on Thursday uh, a set of rules for how it expects uh, its energy like gas to be paid for uh, going forward. So what has been set up today, I guess, is a precautionary response uh, in response to this push by the Kremlin, because as countries like Germany, which are trying to reduce their energy reliance on Russia, they're not quite there yet. They need to work out what they will do in a more formal way if Russia does decide to stop supply. Now, Germany has repeatedly said it would not stop importing energy from Russia due to its dependence. Uh, but how concerned is Berlin right now that Moscow may shut off its gas supplies? Well, one of the underlying messages from Robert Habeck is that it's not in a kind of panic stations mode yet. There is uh, enough gas for industry and consumers. And he kind of highlighted that what has been done today is a more precautionary sense. They are waiting, though, to see what these new rules are uh, that are going to be unveiled on Thursday uh, by Moscow. Uh, Robert Habeck said that as of now, Russia is fulfilling its contractual obligations. Germany, it must be stressed, can't immediately do without Russian gas, but it is working towards that. It's a goal, though, that's going to take uh, a few years to achieve. But the government is saying uh, there is no risk of immediate gas shortage. Mm. DW's uh, Jared Reid there. Thank you very much, Jared.